The Tom Woods Show, episode 1122. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, in 2018, more people than ever are going to be starting up a side hustle online. I know how to do this, and I'll show you step by step exactly what I do in my free ebook, Five Paths to an Online Income. Grab it over at pathstoincome.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. John Bolton and his appointment as National Security Advisor is our topic of conversation today. And who better to talk to about this than Scott Horton? who is the foreign policy go-to guy in the libertarian world. Check him out at scotthorton.org, where he hosts the Scott Horton Show. Absolutely outstanding stuff. He also hosts Anti-War Radio on KPFK in Los Angeles. He is managing director of the Libertarian Institute over at libertarianinstitute.org, and he's the editor over at antiwar.com. Many, many good things to be said about Scott, but it's time to say some, uh, let's say, less flattering things about John Bolton. Very glad to have you once again, Scott. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Tom. You know, you know how sometimes people meet at a funeral and they, they haven't seen each other in a long time and they say, I'm sorry we have to meet under these circumstances? Yeah. Scott, I'm sorry I have to have you on the show under <laughs> these circumstances. All it the is. Time. It's a hell of a thing, isn't it? <laughs> I have you on in the midst of every disaster in the world. <laughs> Always great but, to talk with you, my friend. I appreciate it. Yeah, because I need to talk to Scott Horton at a time like this. So John Bolton now has been tapped to be the national security advisor. Can you say something first about the outgoing H.R. McMaster and maybe contrast him with Bolton? Oh, he's horrible. Good riddance to H.R. McMaster. He's the guy who just basically steamrolled uh, Donald Trump into escalating the war in Afghanistan the same way Petraeus did to Obama uh, back in 09. And, uh, and, you know, they launched, uh, you know, they've escalated by four or 5,000 guys and now years commitment more to combat there. I mean, I guess Trump could flip-flop around. Uh, sure hope he does. Uh, he is horrible on Syria. It was one of the guys who wanted to stay in Syria forever. He's good on the JCPOA, which is the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. He wanted to stay within it and avoid provoking an unnecessary fight with Iran. So got to give him credit for that. Um, but he's horrible on Russia. Absolutely horrible. In fact, there's a great article by Mark Perry about the split between General McMaster and his former commander, Colonel McGregor. Uh, and, and they had their basically, you know, their competing plans for in the event of war with Russia and Eastern Europe, which is the way you do it. This size brigade and that level of supply line and whatever on the, on the logistics of how it would be fought and this kind of thing. And they had this big you know, competition there. But McGregor is the much more conservative in a good way uh, guy, McMaster's former commander from Iraq War I, uh, who, you know, clearly, you know, obviously, if you ever see him on TV or anything, he doesn't want to pick a fight with anybody. Whereas H.R. McMaster is one of these guys who, you know, on, on North Korea, remember all the stories in the Wall Street Journal and everything about, well, they have a plan that maybe they'll give North Korea a bloody nose and they'll hit some nuclear sites and some missile sites. And then that'll be the warning to them that they better look out. Although, of course, that would have a major risk of escalating. And some of the stories about his ouster were that it was Mattis, General Mattis, Marine Corps General Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, or retired now, but still, um, and uh, General Kelly, another four-star Marine Corps general who's now the civilian chief of staff, that they were the ones who pushed McMaster out because of his insistence on pursuing the more hawkish options on North Korea. And that they were, you know, worried this army guy's out of control, the Marines pushed him out of there. Uh, which is kind of an interesting take on it. Anyway, I don't know exactly how true that is, but yeah. So McMaster, you know, well, he's one of these guys who apparently believes his own BS on all of these things. So <laughs> that's the worst thing you could be, right? That's Hillary Clinton's problem, right? She's the, she's the head of the class, but she believes everything she thinks and <laughs> with no exceptions and no review. Well, let's move on then to, um, to John Bolton. And here I've got, courtesy of you, an article that you wrote uh, almost 13 years to the day as we record this, actually, when Bolton was nominated by George W. Bush to be U.S. ambassador to the U.N. God, I'm old. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to link to that article at tomwoods.com slash 1122. 
I mean, not not like it took a lot of effort to be prophetic about John Bowles at that point, but pretty much everything you say came true. Um, I do want to ask you one specific thing about the article. You actually have this line. You say, although he is such a lying warmonger that he's often mistaken for a neoconservative, Bolton positions himself rhetorically somewhere closer to libertarians and anti-war conservatives regarding the application of international law to the United States. Can you just elaborate on that one specific point before we go any further? Yeah. Boy, you could tell I was sort of a, a Will Griggian, uh, John Birch <laughs> influence still a lot back then. I really do sound kind of right wing in that article. It's funny, but I do still mean it, of course. You know, I'm a I'm an anarchist. So abolish the U.N. first, even before you get to the U.S., right? Abolish them all. Um, but uh, yeah, no. So my position there, the article is called Who's Afraid of John Bolton? And it's basically describing him as a funhouse mirror version of Ron Paul, right? So where Ron Paul says, well, we should have total independence and peace. We don't need the United Nations to tell us that it's illegal to start a war. We don't need the United Nations to tell us that we have to prosecute our war criminals if we have some, which we do, by the way. Um, That's our business to do. And, And we should just lead by example and respect the independence of the rest of the world too, right? And so... Uh, from that Will Griggy and Ron Paulian view, then the United Nations is a big trap that gets us into trouble. You can't have all this international law unless you have a one world army to enforce it. And guess who's volunteered for the job? And so, and then of course we see what that does to the world and to our own society when our government puts America in this role. And so, instead, we should just be unilaterally at peace. We should have a Swiss foreign policy where we don't need a veto on the Security Council because we just don't have an international policy at all other than leave us alone and we'll leave you alone and everything is cool. No sanctions, no threats, because we have actually no states on the planet to fear. And our only enemies, the only actual enemies we have are these stateless bands of jihadi terrorists who are provoked by America's intervention in the first place and who are sustained by our allies and a lot of times, including even by our own intelligence agencies. So really none of it has to be. And so that's the point of the article is that if we would take John Bolton at his word that none of this international law applies to us, well, what about the part where we have to enforce it on everybody else? Can we abandon that too? And that was kind of what I was getting at there. Yeah, I, but first of all, I love that expression, the funhouse mirror version of some, I'm going to use that at some point. We have a lot of funhouse mirror versions of our of our good guys. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking at uh, a recent article. I mean, the American conservative has been very good on this. And I've got an article here where they just list all that they don't elaborate on, they list where he stands on various issues. But in a way, I, even without knowing the details of Bolton, I could have guessed where he stood on any of these issues. But Gareth Porter had an article recently about how when uh, Bolton was in the Bush administration, he was actively trying to undermine already frayed relations between the U.S. and Iran. And he he actually just fudged evidence to to claim that there were nuclear sites that weren't actually there. Mm -hmm. Um, I assume you've read this and I'm sure you know about all that, but can you start there? Start with uh, Bolton and Iran. Yeah. Well, geez, I'm sorry, everybody. I hope this isn't the rest of the interview because he's horrible on Russia, North Korea, and all kinds of things. All these crises are his fault personally uh, with Russia and Korea. I hope we can get back to that. But uh, Iran, 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 the guy's obsessed with Iran. And, you know, he basically just has Israel's point of view on Iran. And he spent his time uh, in power in the Bush administration first as the Undersecretary of State for Arms Control and Prevention um, under Colin Powell. Well, next to Colin Powell, at least at the State Department there in the first term. And then later was the recess appointment, unconfirmed ambassador to the United Nations and constantly working all the time to prevent negotiations from working. Um, not, not playing good cop, bad cop in order to make Iran sign the deal, but constantly treating compromise as the enemy of progress. That what we need is a confrontation. What we need ultimately is a full scale regime change in Iran. And anything less than that is a half measure. And listen, I want to play this clip for you. It's just 30 seconds long. Uh, it's from a conference call with John Bolton talking to the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, which is the most powerful kind of umbrella group of the Israel lobby in America. 
And he's describing to them what he was trying to do with passing this new set of sanctions through the UN Security Council, which he complains had been watered down by Russia, but still. And so here's what we're doing with the sanctions, according to John Bolton. This, this is him speaking uh, to APAC in January of 2007. Let me turn now to the question of, uh, of Iran and uh, uh, what I think the uh, situation is there. Uh, uh, the uh, Security Council just passed a resolution. The resolution that the Security Council passed uh, at the end of last month imposing uh, certain limited sanctions on Iran, uh, obviously the product of a long uh, effort uh, based on Iran's refusal to comply with the earlier Security Council resolution that gave them until August the 31st to cease their uranium enrichment activity. I'm a, a private citizen and therefore a free man again, uh, and can these are my personal views now, uh, it, that this resolution, the sanctions resolution, is very disappointing. Uh, it is not as tough as uh, I would have liked to have seen it. Uh, in many respects, the Russians did uh, an outstanding job from their point of view in protecting Iran, in narrowing the scope of the sanctions, uh, in uh, uh, limiting the effectiveness, I think, of, of any of the things that we wanted to try and do to, to prevent the Iranians from continuing to make progress on their nuclear and ballistic missile programs. Um, I think the Iranian reaction to the sanctions resolution uh, has been very uh, telling in that respect, uh, although they've passed a resolution in Parliament uh, to uh, reevaluate their relationship with the International Atomic Energy Agency. They have not rejected the sanctions resolution. They have not done anything more dramatic, such as withdrawing from the Non-Proliferation Treaty or uh, throwing out inspectors of the International Atomic Energy Agency, which uh, I actually hope they would do, that uh, that, that kind of reaction would uh, produce a counter reaction actually would uh, would be more beneficial to us. Okay, so you see right there, he's conceding, which should be the only major first point of any discussion of Iran's nuclear program is that they are part of the non-proliferation treaty. They have been since the late sixties or very early seventies uh, under the Shah, and they have therefore under the the non-proliferation treaty obligations, they have an agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency to constantly and continuously inspect all of their nuclear facilities in order to guarantee the non-diversion of nuclear material to any military purpose. And so what he's saying is, well, how am I supposed to have a regime change if I can't credibly accuse them of trying to develop nuclear weapons because the whole world knows that they're still within the treaty and they still have a safeguards agreement and there's IAEA inspectors crawling all over the place and seals on their equipment and cameras and sensors and everything else. And so he's saying what we're trying to do with the sanctions is get the right wing in Iran to react. And say, if this is how the Americans are going to treat us, then let's withdraw from the treaty. And then we can say, aha, now they're making nukes. Now you can't deny us our Casa Spelly here to go ahead and have a preemptive attack uh, and invade Iran or bomb Iran in order to uh, degrade their nuclear program. In fact, there's a new article that came out, I think it's today. Um, no, pardon me, yesterday in the Times of Israel, where the former defense minister of Israel Shaul Mofaz says that when, and this is not after, this is when he was still in the government, in the Bush government, that he urged the Israeli government to go ahead and start the war when George W. Bush would not. I mean, George W. Bush told Ehud Olmert, no, and we understand your concern. Don't worry. We're not going to let them make nuclear weapons, which of course they're not making anyway. So, uh, it's not going to happen. In fact, Bush complained in his memoirs, how am I supposed to start the war after the CIA said in 2007 that Iran wasn't making nuclear weapons? There goes my fake excuse to start a war, right? So, shrug. And Bolton then told the Israelis, you guys should start it anyway. And of course, we know from Seymour Hersh back at the time that Cheney was telling them the same thing. And then that, that would be okay to do an end run around Bush and to try to force us into a war with Iran for Israel. 
by provoking an Iranian reaction, you know, literally in that way. So, and then if you listen to anything he says about Iran, uh, even when he talks about Syria, you know how I've told you over and over, Tom, that the war in Syria that the, uh, the Obama administration has waged there is basically they're trying to get rid of Assad as their consolation prize after George Bush shooting America and our Sunni ally coalition in the foot by invading Iraq and, and fighting a civil war for the Shiite supermajority backed by Iran there. And they said, well, we can't start Iraq War II all over again and fight the whole civil war for the other side, right? So, but you know what we could do is take out Assad. Well, and I think that's really, I mean, if you hear Obama tell it to Jeffrey Goldberg in the Atlantic, um, uh, I don't bluff is the title of the uh, interview that that's exactly how Obama saw it, um, that this could help take Iran down a peg. Um, and yet, so Bolton says, we shouldn't be messing around with Assad. We should just do regime change in Tehran. And then that way, it doesn't matter if Assad's still in power in Syria because he's no longer a conduit for the evil Ayatollah regime that we already got rid of. So why mess around? And that's the point of John Bolton on a uh, point of view of John Bolton on that. And by the way, I mean, if we have a war with Iran, not that they could ever attack the United States of America, but they can attack American assets all up and down the Persian Gulf, including in Bahrain and Qatar, where we have the fifth fleet stationed at Bahrain and we have a massive air base in Qatar. We have God knows what in Kuwait and in Iraq, where Americans are right now fighting Iraq war three and a half. After the fall of Islamic State in Western Iraq, there's still a permanent mopping up exercise to do in Western Iraqi Sunni stand there. And that war is still going on. And we still have troops stationed, of course, in Helmand province and at Bagram Air Base and in Nangarhar and whatever all over Afghanistan, uh, who are in missile range of the Iranians. We have, and of course, the, the Shiites in Iraq would, would certainly uh, rise up and backstab the Americans that they're that are embedded with them right now uh, fighting in Iraq war three and a half there. So, you know, they have the ability absolutely to strike back in a very serious way against American assets in the region. If John Bolton was to get his way and start a war there, it would not be a cake walk. It would be an absolute catastrophe. Now we've, you and I, and some other guests I've had on as well have talked about the prospects of an Iran war and what the arguments against it might be. So we've got a lot of that already covered on, in other episodes, and I'm going to link to those also at tomwoods.com slash 1122. But anyway, we can talk about uh, a lot of other things with regard to Bolton. I mean, obviously, you can imagine where he would have stood on the Iraq war, and I don't know what he's said in recent months about it, if he's commented at all, but as recently as 2015, he says, I still think the decision to overthrow Saddam was correct. Oh, he said uh, that just a, a month ago or so on the Tucker show. Did he say a show. month ago? Okay, so yeah, if you look that. at my Twitter, there's an interview where Tucker asks him about it, and he says no. Oh, the you know, Tucker interview, that's right. It's amazing, actually, that interview. God, this guy. So then, then um, I'm, again, I'm reading from an article on the American conservative. Mm -hmm. On Libya in 2011, before the Obama administration launched its calamitous intervention, Bolton recommended that the U.S. assassinate Muammar Gaddafi, um, he, rec he In North Korea, he recently suggested there was a legal case for a first strike. Um, he wants Trump to get tougher on Russia, including launching a cyber attack. Uh, he wants to revisit the one China policy um, with regard to Taiwan. Where, where, where do you want to go next? Well, let's talk about North Korea because this is, well, no, let, let's talk about Iraq because uh, this is, you know, the most important event of our era so far is Iraq War II. And his role in that, well, there, he, he played a huge part of it in the State Department in the first Bush junior term. But one of the things that he did was he got this Brazilian named Jose Bustani fired from the OPCW, which is the Organization for Prevention of Chemical Weapons. I think, yeah. Anyway, these are, this is the UN organization that um, has a specific mandate. They're like the IAEA of chemical weapons. Uh, kind of thing. That's their their speciality. Uh, these are the guys who, uh, you know, make the claims one way or the other when there are false flag sarin attacks in Syria, for example, uh, if people are familiar with that. But so here's the problem. 
Saddam Hussein signed up for the OPCW, you know, the Chemical Weapons Treaty, and signed a deal with the OPCW and said, come on in and look around. And the Bush administration was aghast at this. They're like, hey, this is our fake excuse for war. We can't have them being certified to be free. This is a kind of whole new round of weapons inspections going on. And Hussein was saying, come on in. And so Bolton did everything he could and got the guy fired. And then, you know, his successor didn't dare. And the, and of course, it's like the public choice theory, right? There's even a quote where they say, well, the rest of the board of the OPCW decided it was better to go ahead and fire him and go along with the Americans on this or else the Americans would suspend funding and the organization wouldn't exist at all anymore. And so in order to keep their own jobs, they threw this guy under the bus and, and threw their mission under the bus when they could have stopped the war. So that's one. Yeah. And then also, as you're saying, is just the biggest booster is, you know, up there with Bill Crystal and Paul Wolfowitz as far as um, in arguing for it at the time and the necessity of it. And then in that Tucker interview, absolutely refuses to concede that Iran was empowered by the war. You know, just because they were empowered later doesn't mean that it was the war that empowered them or some kind of thing. He tries to do these gymnastics around it. And Tucker didn't quite follow up, but Obviously. Yeah, so so in other words, they would have been equally powerful if if Iraq were just as strong today as it was 15 years ago. They, the, Iran would be equally powerful in the region. I mean, he How basically could that be? he basically implies he's he says the mistake was installing Paul Bremer and the coalition provisional authority, which in other words, that's part of the narrative that they should have just gone ahead and installed Chalabi and left and then everything would have been fine, which is just nonsense. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, the yeah. history of the war, the most important part of the war for people to understand is the Ayatollah Sistani, the highest ranking Shiite cleric in January of 2004, said, if you believe in God, Go outside and tell George Bush one man, one vote. And they did. And that was it. Because what were they going to do? Is start the war all over again against the supermajority they just invaded on behalf of? Nope. And so, but then at that point, it was simply a battle to put Iran's men in charge in the country, the Dawa party and Scary and the rest we've talked about before. So the Bush guys imagined that the Iraqis are basically irrelevant here. The people of Iraq are basically irrelevant. We'll just have our own way and do what we want. But then it didn't work out like that. All right. Now that one, that one was kind of obvious, but less obvious because people don't probably keep up that much with Bolton would be what his views on North Korea are. And North Korea is a real, uh, in fact, I just, just the other day I was talking to, um, you know, an acquaintance who said, yeah, you know, I'm not thrilled with the way the country's going, but the appointment of Bolton, now that's great. We really need a guy who's going to get tough. And I just didn't know where to begin, really, talking to this guy. Mm. So so Bolton is saying we could make a case for a first strike, a legal case. But, okay, a legal case is different from should we do it? Does he think we should do it is the question. Yeah. Um, all compromise to this guy is, you know, conceding to Hitler at Munich. Uh, everything's a zero sum game and you know america is the strongest power we should never have to concede anything to anyone ever doesn't matter if we're right or wrong or if they've got a point or not or any kind of thing at all and where you know somebody who's not a lawyer maybe could understand that actually america has so much as he says, we're such a dominant power. We have so much that we can afford to give a lot and it amounts to a little, right? We have so many carrots to offer North Korea, maybe not even with sticks at all, that, you know, if it was Ron Paul, for example, he would just, and I know this because he told me so, he would just drop the sanctions. He would recognize our government. He would immediately, you know, as fast as possible, move to negotiate a permanent end to the Korean War, which we still, do. kids, do you know that we still only have a ceasefire is all we have to end the Korean War of the 19, early 1950s. Uh, and, and he would move that piece and he would, you know, basically give them a security guarantee. We promise not to attack you. And then I forgot if he said this or not, but obviously I'm just making the case. It'd be easy as hell for America to say, you give up your nukes and missiles because you don't need them anymore because we're not a threat anymore. We're going to work this out. We're going to, just like with Nixon and Kissinger shaking hands with Mao Zedong, we still have a lot of outstanding issues, but we're going to go ahead and break the ice now. We're going to work out the, the outstanding issues later, but we're going to go ahead and stop being enemies. And so we could afford to do that. That's obvious. 
And, you know, just like, you know, and I'm a libertarian. I'm for abolishing the national government altogether. I'm not for taxation or anything. But if the Bill Clinton government is spending a few measly billion dollars to bribe the North Koreans to not make nuclear weapons and to stay inside the nonproliferation treaty, then like, hey, okay, I don't We'll abolish that later. We got, we'll start with abolishing the FBI and the CIA and stuff. And we'll put bribing North Korea to not make nukes later on the chopping block of the line items here, you know? Um, And that was the deal that Bill Clinton had, a perfectly reasonable deal that Bill Clinton had, uh, where America would give them a measly amount of welfare and fuel oil. And they would pay Donald Rumsfeld's company to build two light water reactors. Now, the significance of that is a light water reactor produces plutonium waste, but it's very polluted with all these other isotopes and makes it virtually useless for possible nuclear weapons fuel. Whereas a heavy water reactor produces plutonium that if you reprocess it carefully one time, you're ready to go with implosion bombs. No problem. So a light water reactor is basically... You guys leave your Soviet era heavy water reactor off and we'll give you light water reactors instead. This was the deal. Now, the Americans never lived up to it. Newt Gingrich and the Republicans in Congress prevented Bill Clinton from living up to the deal. But the North Koreans still stayed within it. But when the Bush Jr. administration came into power in 2001, they immediately set about to ruin the deal. In fact, there's even footage of Colin Powell saying, yes, we're going to stay within the deal, which is a pretty good deal. And in the background, you can see Dick Cheney and the the guys are seething. And they're like, yeah, that's what you think, pal. And (laughs) because that was not the plan. (laughs) And um, so anyway, um, now what they did, they went through all these steps. And the, the best article, you won't be surprised to find out, is written by Gareth Porter about this. Um, and it just came out in truthout.org a couple of months ago. And it's about how Cheney and his allies, something ruined the North Korean nuclear deal. And so from the very beginning, Bush came in and called Kim a pygmy and a tyrant and just took that, you know, negative insulting attitude. Um, then they, uh, David Frum and, uh, and George Bush put North Korea in the axis of evil. Get this. Osama bin Laden, Saddam Hussein, the Ayatollah, <laughs> and Kim Jong-il. Oh, yeah, no, they're all a big alliance against you, right? Just like uh, Germany, Japan, and Italy in World War II. They're the Axis power of evil, uh, this group, none of whom have any tie to each other at all. <laughs> but anyway, I guess, you know, the Iranians have bought some missiles from North Korea or something, but there's your Axis. Um, and so they did that, but still the deal was there. But then in 2002, first John Bolton himself as Undersecretary of State for Arms Control and Prevention tried to break the deal on the basis of saying that the North Koreans were in violation of an agreement they'd made with South Korea back in 1990 that they wouldn't make nukes. But basically everyone had already dismissed that. They had this new deal anyway and it didn't matter. He was just grasping at straws for that. And then they accused Iran of having a secret uranium enrichment program, which at the time I very sincerely doubt, I have no reason to believe amounted to anything more than they had bought some aluminum tubes, some centrifuge material, some actual centrifuge material, unlike the Iraqi aluminum tubes, uh, from AQ Khan, uh, the Pakistani nuclear scientist who the CIA tolerated him stealing the plans for all this stuff. And, and Reagan tolerated the creation of the Pakistani nuclear program, nuclear weapons program in the first place back in the eighties. So anyway, that our, our Pakistani allies proliferated some of this material to North Korea and Iran. Not that the Iranians ever made weapons with it or tried to, but the North Koreans had some of this uranium enrichment material. And so, uh, they were accused of having, they were accused of admitting in a unprovable, uh, way that they had this secret uranium enrichment program. And at that point, the Americans announced that we are no longer respecting the agreed framework. The deal is off because you broke it. But in fact, the agreed framework didn't say anything about enriching uranium. They have the right under the NPT to enrich uranium as long as it's not weapons grade and as long as they're not diverting it to a, a weapons program. And in fact, their Soviet era reactor was originally designed to run on weapons grade uranium on extremely highly enriched uranium. And so they even had a peaceful explanation for that, possibly if they were even doing that, which is unproven, but still. So, but instead of saying, hey, there's, we have concerns about uranium. Let's negotiate further. Let's figure out what's going on here and let's get you back within the safeguards the way we want you. They took this as an excuse 
to abrogate the deal and say the deal is off. Then they announced new sanctions on North Korea. Then they announced what they called the Proliferation Security Initiative, which said that we can just, it was just some brand new made up thing in violation of all the laws of the seas that says that uh, the Americans can seize all North Korean shipping uh, it, under the accusation that it all must be weapons for the Syrians or the Iranians or whoever. And then in December of 2002, they put out the nuclear posture review that said that North Korea was on deck for a possible nuclear first strike in a preemptive regime change operation. And at that point, the Iranian, uh, the North Koreans finally said, Kim Jong-il finally said, all right, you win. Just like the clip of Bolton I played you earlier, we're trying to get them to withdraw from the treaty. They withdrew from the treaty and they kicked the IAEA inspectors out of the country. And only then did they start making nuclear weapons. And only in 2006 did they ever explode them. And it was John Bolton himself who was basically... Uh, as Gareth Porter put it, Cheney's point man on this and trying to come up with any reason to scotch that deal and force them out of the deal. And as Gareth Porter puts it in that article, it was all to sell missile defense systems. They would, rather than resolve a crisis easily or keep a, a deal going that's working, they would rather push the North Koreans to nukes, not so they have an excuse to even attack because they didn't attack before the nukes were ready, right? I guess they were too bogged down in Iraq for that. But they can use North Korea as an excuse to sell the Star Wars and anti-ballistic, I guess really mostly ground-based anti-ballistic missile systems, um, which is just this huge cash cow. In fact, uh, one more tangent on that. Our current director of national intelligence, Dan Coates, was the original choice of Cheney to be the secretary of defense. This is in the book Rumsfeld by Andrew Coburn, who's awesome. And in his job interview, he said, oh, come on, you know, missile defense is a big boondoggle. Let's not do that, you know? And they said, okay, don't call us, we'll call you. And it was at that point that Cheney said to Bush, well, there's my old friend Donald Rumsfeld, but your dad hates him. And Bush said, great, give him a call. And then that was how Donald Rumsfeld, fatefully for the future of all mankind, got the job as defense secretary in the Bush Jr., term that was a huge priority of theirs was you know drumming up the threat get this we have to put anti-missile missiles in poland to protect the poles from their historical enemy iran which doesn't have missiles that can reach them and doesn't have any nukes and isn't even making nukes to put on missiles they don't have to reach the poles who obviously these anti-missile missiles are not for you know uh who are, obviously this is all about russia and not iran at all but makes a great excuse and also it makes a great excuse to hold the North Korean threat over the heads of our allies, the South Koreans and the Japanese. You know, somebody, well, somebody probably has done it, but it would be interesting to see a study of 20th century diplomatic history where you have various proposals raised to solve different problems or bring about ceasefires or prevent wars and whatever. And how many times the U.S. regime or parts of that regime have deliberately tried to scuttle these or more commonly to make demands that everybody in his right mind knows are non-starters right. and not going to happen. Yeah, look at Iraq War One. Look at Iraq War One, where they're building up Desert Shield and now you can't negotiate. What are you going to do? Negotiate and pull all the troops out now? Nah, it's on. Yeah. So Hussein is sued for peace over and over. Look at 1999, the Ramble Ye Accord in Kosovo, where they admitted I was thinking Americans that. brag yeah. that it's an offer they can't possibly accept. Yeah. It's an ultimatum they can't possibly sign on to. It'll be a great excuse to start a war when they refuse. Yeah, so on the one hand, they can't possibly sign it. On the other hand, when they don't, then they then that becomes the reason to to bomb them. The, the, I'm sure there are many cases of this. It would be interesting to get a whole bunch of them. But mm -hmm. let's let's make sure we have some time to talk about Bolton on the uh, the question of Russia. And then I want to close with a word about Afghanistan. So mm -hmm. I assume Bolton has the fairly basically Bolton is likely to sh for all the media whining about Bolton. Well, they have a lot more common with Bolton than they have with Scott Horton when it comes to Russia. Yeah, I mean, he's absolutely a Russia hawk. And, you know, um, I don't know if I, he has not been part of this whole resist movement and claiming that Trump is a Russian puppet and all that. Um, but that's all nonsense anyway. But what, you know, he's a big promote, uh, proponent of NATO expansion, which is the root of all of our problems with the Russians anyway. And he was the point man on 
withdrawing from the anti-ballistic missile treaty, uh, the ABM treaty in the first Bush Jr. term. And I'm sure you must know about this where uh, Vladimir Putin gave this three hour State of the Union speech type thing uh, in Russia about three weeks ago. And he spent a whole, uh, you know, giant portion of it describing Russian advances in nuclear weapons and basically explaining that the American attempt to build up anti-missile forces in such a way to give us an advantage, uh, and possibly a first strike type advantage um, in, in, in essence, canceling out uh, mutually assured destruction, which has kept the peace seemingly so far. Uh, he said, we tried to tell him over and over again. We tried to get them to listen to us that, listen, we can't just take this sitting down. Um, you know, in fact, Jack Matlock, the second to last ambassador to the Soviet Union under Ronald Reagan and uh, George Bush, uh, he at one point in some meeting over there told Putin, listen, you know that all this missile defense stuff is really just welfare for our corporations and the military industrial complex racket, this kind of thing, right? And Putin says, you know, people say that and it makes sense to me, but listen, look at the position I'm in. I got to take this as a serious thing. You know, if you're going to be able to try to, you're trying to make it where you can shoot down all my missiles, I'm going to have to figure out a way around that, right? And so, listen to me. And and one of the things he said in this speech three weeks ago was, they'll, they're listening now. And what he did was he announced that he has, for one thing, a cruise missile, a nuclear power cruise missile, he claims, that has virtually an unlimited range that can fly anywhere on the planet and evade any... Uh, missile defense systems by just going around whatever radius is set up there. And in his cartoon of showing how it would work, he shows it launching from northern Russia down south across, catty corner across the Atlantic Ocean, around the southern tip of South America and up the Pacific coast where then it could branch off to either Hawaii, LA, San Francisco, whatever you got. The long way around to the American Pacific coast, just to prove the point. And then talked about a new ballistic missile, uh, uh, an extremely heavy ballistic missile that uh, will come up from the South Pole. And from the south, where America has no missile defenses there, instead of over the North Pole. And they even show in the cartoon South Florida, Mar Lago as the, as the target. Um, and then they talked about a drone submarine, an unmanned submarine that's meant to deliver, you know, multi megaton warheads to, say, for example, the Bay Area. Um, uh, and, and, you know, when you get into the tens of megatons, you're talking about being able to really kill all of those cities in one shot. Um, and then also he talked about supersonic, uh, ultrasonic, uh, hypersonic, whatever, gliders that, can, you know, never be tracked and shot down. Um, and that can be launched from jets and also another version that can be launched from intercontinental ballistic missiles as well. And where they can have multiple hypersonic gliders. And he's just saying... You know, basically, the Americans act like they can just do whatever they want. Does this sound exactly like Ron Paul talking in, in the debate with Giuliani? You think you can just do whatever you want and ignore and pretend that that there are no consequences or when the consequences come, they're all motivated by something else. But when you insist on looking at it that way, you do so at your own peril. And so now look at me now and, you know. In, in essence, this is one rocket could kill all of Texas, right? San Antonio, Houston, and, you know, all of, uh, you know, Texas City and Galveston and Corpus, Dallas, Fort Worth, and El Paso, and Austin, and, and Fort Hood, and we're done, Fort Bliss. And, and that's one rocket to take out the biggest state in the Union. I mean, forget Alaska, but. Um, so, you know, now are you deterred, John Bolton? Or now this just proves, as as um, George Kennan predicted uh, back in 1998, when the Russians react, the American hawks will just say, see, this is why we need NATO expansion. This is why we need this buildup to contain Russian aggression when it's all their fault in the first place. Yeah, I don't know where to go with that, Scott, other than to say, um, in the interest of time, I want to make sure we get a mention also of Afghanistan. I don't know if Bolton, I mean, he comments on everything, so he must have had an opinion on Afghanistan, but I want to mention that in particular because 
uh, listeners of this show are just huge fans of the book you wrote on it called Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. I have people just saying uh, it's just an astonishingly good book, and I'm getting feedback like that all the time. More people need to read it. You have a website for it, foolserrand.us, and the audio book has just been released. And the beauty of that is you, if, you, if you sign up for Audible, which you can then cancel if you don't want it, by the way, but when you sign up, you get a free audiobook. You can make Scott's your free audiobook. And then if you decide you hate Audible, you can quit and keep Scott's audiobook for free, and Scott still gets the royalty. So um, the link to do that is TomWoodsAudio.com. TomWoodsAudio.com. Get that audiobook that just came out. But what does uh, what's Bolton's opinion on Afghanistan? I shudder to ask, but for the sake of completeness, I feel that I must. Well, I mean, basically, I don't know how much I don't know a lot of his record on Afghanistan. I could actually see him taking the position that "Eh, screw Afghanistan only in the sense that because the real enemy is Iran or some other crazy thing. I forgot to mention what a partisan he is of the MEK cult. Uh, But anyway, um, you know, as far as I know, he's basically uh, from from what I could tell in my short amount of research that I did. Uh, on this particular question is he invokes the safe haven myth, uh, which just says that, you know, if we leave Afghanistan, then the terrorists will move back in and then they'll attack us. And uh, this is, I talk about this in the book, but I also wrote an article for the American conservative magazine about this called war without a rationale about how the safe haven myth is exactly a myth and how all the people that America's fighting there are locals, not international jihadi terrorist types, and how the Taliban have a huge incentive to prevent bin Ladenites from returning to Afghanistan, certainly in the part of the country where they rule. Um, and it's and they've said for years that if we would just leave them alone, that they would never let international terrorists use Afghanistan against the U.S. or anybody else again, which I'm not saying you can believe them, but then again, they have a lot of reason to live up to that. And and Mullah Omar always hated bin Laden anyway. They were stuck with those guys. The Taliban didn't attack us. They tried to warn us that attack was coming. So anyway, that's all overblown. But this is exactly the kind of position that you would expect Bolton to take, right? That if you ever stop doing anything, then everything bad that happens after that is your fault. Now, it doesn't matter all the bad things that happen while you're in the middle of doing something because, hey, that's just despite your best efforts, you know. Um, but so of course he's the kind of guy who would blame Obama for creating ISIS, not for backing their group in essence, uh, by, you know, a couple degree, one degree of separation really in Syria, but just for leaving Iraq. And, uh, and so this is, you know, Trump invoked that exact rationale himself when he announced the escalation there in August that, um, you know, look what happened in Iraq. We can't let that happen here. So I would expect for his advice to Trump to be that we have to stay, that he will be HR McMaster on the Afghan issue after all, you know, what difference does it truly make in the end? As Hillary Clinton said, I'm looking at an article in national review by David French. Maybe you saw this. It's called John Bolton. Isn't dangerous. The world is. So it sounds like right out of David from, and the first sentence is it's time to give a hawk a chance. And he's the point of the article is to say, look, uh, Bolton has a lot of credentials. He's not extreme. He's very smart. And if you're going to say he's dangerous, well, what about nuclear-armed Iran and North Korea? You're saying that's less dangerous than the presence of John Bolton yeah. as national security advisor? Ain't it great? That is the talking point. Yeah. It's just like Bob Higgs says about World War II, right, how they always truncate the antecedents. <laughs> so you can sit here and say, yeah, we need a tough guy like Bolton to handle our crisis with a nuclear armed North Korea that is only armed with nukes because he personally made it that way. But never mind that. It really is amazing that these guys aren't discredited or they are, but they're just so relentless that they just never go away. And he's not truly a neocon, but basically he is. You know, he's a he's a lifelong Goldwater right winger. He's not a former Trotskyite or a son of a crystal or a gold farb or anything, but he's might as well be one of them. And they just never quit. And, you know, he's the kind of guy, especially when he's on TV and stuff, he speaks with such certainty about all his nonsense that if you don't know anything, then at least it sounds like he knows what he's talking about, you know, and that's good enough, especially if apparently that's good enough for a guy like Trump, even though Trump ought to know that this guy can do nothing but get you in trouble, you know? Look at the legacy of the whole George Bush era is wish we hadn't done that. Everybody agrees about that now, you know, but 
<laughs> he's going to hire John Bolton? But, uh, you know, but for, for, his national security advisor. But French ends his article by saying the foreign policy debate is frequently between hawks and doves, which, by the way, is certainly not true. That 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 is absolutely not true. Right. But he says it's frequently between hawks and doves. And in the last administration, the doves repeatedly failed. It's time to give a hawk a chance. That's just right out of George Orwell, that right there. Yeah, exactly. When have the doves been in charge of anything? When when Hillary Clinton was the Secretary of State? I mean, Obama did two good things. He somewhat a little bit opened up Cuba, and he did the Iran nuclear deal. Every other thing that he did was George Bush's foreign policy. The drone war in Pakistan that George Bush was really just starting right as Obama came into power, that was his thing. The surge in Afghanistan, that was exactly what George Bush said was necessary. Too bad I'm out of time. We need a surge in Afghanistan. Good luck, new guy, on your surge in Afghanistan, he said. And then, you know, he he really made George Bush's same policy in Yemen that much worse, which we can't get into all the myriad consequences of that. Somalia, he doubled down on Bush. And does anybody doubt Bush would have done Gaddafi in the same way Obama did? In fact, maybe not, because Bush was the one who signed the deal with him. It took Obama to backstab him and start that war in Libya, which, you know, by the way, New York Times this morning is Donald Trump is launching drone strikes against not just ISIS, but now Al-Qaeda targets in Libya, where in 2011, America fought a war for Al-Qaeda in Libya. So, yeah, no wonder they're crawling around there. Uh, So, yeah, when were the doves in charge? What doves? Yeah. Obama backed the jihadis in Syria, leading to the rise of the Islamic State, and then had to launch Iraq War III in order to clear out the Islamic State that he just really created. Yeah. Too bad the peaceniks are running around, you know, dictating the (laughs) big American world empire, which doesn't stop killing people for five minutes at any time ever in the last 25 years. When you would hear Obama talk about it, he would always say, we can't, we can't retreat into isolation. <laughs> yeah. Anytime somebody would say, do you sure we need Americans in eight zillion countries? And the alternative to that is to retreat into isolation. I, I know that a lot of times they just speak in sound bites because they figure that'll hold over the rubes, but it's almost like we're dealing with bots who just have programmed responses. You know, like when you're getting customer service messages in the lower right corner of your screen at 3 a.m. when you go to a website, you know there's nobody awake over there, and yet somebody's asking you, may I help you today? And it's just waiting for a few words that you say, and they'll give you a canned response. It's like that's how everybody, if, if we opened their heads and it was all just wiring inside their heads and it turns out they were robotic all along, I wouldn't be as surprised as I probably ought to be. Yeah. Now, meanwhile... I want to tell people that you should listen. I mean, when I advertise another podcast, that means I really support that podcast. And the Scott Horton Show should definitely be listened to because Scott knows everything there is to know. And on the off chance there's something he doesn't know, he brings on a guest who knows whatever the topic is. The Scott Horton Show uh, is indispensable. But more than that, Scott himself is indispensable. And Scott is one of a handful of people I personally donate to every month. You can visit him at scotthorton.org. And if you like what he's doing, we libertarians need to put our money where our mouths are. When we say, oh, well, in a free society, we wouldn't need public television because people would voluntarily donate to ad free television or whatever it is that we would voluntarily do. Why don't we start voluntarily doing some of that right now? And one thing you can do is voluntarily start giving to Scott, who gives to us every day, who's always doing stuff. And by the way, that book on Afghanistan, Fool's Errand, which you should go out and buy and check it out at foolserrand.us. Yeah, Scott will earn a little money from that, but not nearly enough to compensate him for the time and energy he put into it. He put, in, put that time and energy in because he believes in this cause. And that's the kind of guy he is, and that's exactly the kind of guy we want to support, whether or not we've reached a free society yet or not, we still need to be supporting our people. And Scott is somebody who deserves support. So check him out at scotthorton.org. Scott, any parting words? Dang, Tom, thanks a lot. You laid on pretty thick there. I appreciate that very hey, much. I can make a good pitch when I when I need to make a good pitch. I Nobody's better. <laughs> well, I can tell that you really mean it. So thanks a lot, man. I do mean it. You're darn right. I've known, I've known Scott. I remember, I'll just tell one quick story. You used to host something years ago called the Weekend Interview Show. Yeah. And, you know, and I had been on, uh, you know, occasional podcasts here and there. I don't even know if they were called podcasts in those days, but uh, this is like in the early 2000s. 
And I, I, there were people, you know, who would write a few articles on lourockwell.com and they'd get on your show. And I had written a whole bunch of articles and I wasn't on your show. And I began to think, what the heck? What am I, the only libertarian who doesn't get on the weekend interview show? And then I was finally invited on because I think my first book had come out. And I thought, I really thought to myself, I've arrived. Because finally, Scott Horton wants to interview me. <laughs> That's funny. The first time I remember talking with you was over email, over, you know, all the compiled proofs that they hate us because of Bill Clinton's foreign policy and this kind of thing, as opposed to, you know, because Islam makes them hate virtue and this kind of garbage, which would have been, I think, in 2004 or five, something like that, um, before the Giuliani moment and stuff. Yeah. But wait, you asked me if I had final words. And so, yes, I totally forgot to say that Bolton dodged the draft in Vietnam. This ultimate warmonger, when he had a chance to go fight, he went and joined the Maryland National Guard and had a job driving trucks around Baltimore and talked about it as, you know, described it in his memoirs as dodging the draft. But he said that his World War II hero father said it was OK, so it was OK. And he only regrets how it looks now since he's such a warmonger. Um, and then one more thing about that. Uh, oh, no, one more thing about something else, which I totally forgot to say, which is the funniest thing is, remember when they ran the ad about how Rand Paul will get Israel nuked? That was John Bolton's group that put out that ad. They're like, didn't show a family like sitting at dinner and a nuke goes off outside? They all die. And they're like, this is the future Rand Paul wants or something. Yeah, isn't that funny? And if he was, that was Bolton. And of course, if he was a Goldwater right? That idiot should have known that they they pulled that on Goldwater. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, that's and, probably where but, they but got that was it for, from. That was right? for different reasons. Yeah. That was to, that was because Bol that was because Goldwater was a hawk. But if you're not a hawk, as Rand is perceived as not being a hawk, right. Then it's okay to say, well, <laughs> you know, you're basically calling for people to be nuked. I mean, how low how low IQ does it get, and how cynical would you have to be about the American public to pitch it that way? Now, of course, I. Don't put a lot of stock in the American public myself, but for heaven's sake, yep. have some standards. Anyway, scotthorton.org is where you should go to uh, follow Scott. Am I, is there anything else I should be giving out? How about Libertarian Institute? Oh, yeah. Me and Sheldon Richmond. It was Will Grigg was our third guy, but he died, which is the worst thing since Iraq War II. Um, but me and Sheldon Richmond and uh, Jared LaBelle were over there uh, at the Libertarian Institute. We got a lot of great writers we're, we're sort of the new guys, but uh, we're trying. And also, I'm the editor of antiwar.com, which is really the most important site in the world. I pick out the viewpoints there. Ah, okay. All right. So, look, I don't want to overload people. ScottHorton.org, most indispensable. Uh, then, let's say Tide would be antiwar.com and libertarianinstitute.org. Right. But don't worry. If you can't keep all that straight, it'll all be linked at tomwoods.com slash 1122. All right. We're going to call it quits for today, Scott, but thanks so much for your time and all this great information. Thanks again, Tom. Love talking with you. All right, folks. Well, how about something a little happy before we depart for today after this fairly depressing conversation? And for that happy thing, not only is the fact that I have somebody coming over to measure my office to be carpeted so that we'll get uh, improved audio here. And by the way, today, yeah, I know, I partway through the tone of the audio changed because somehow my initial recording, I don't know, something dropped out, but Scott had a backup. And I don't know, just, just one of those days. But I am going to get the thing carpeted so that we'll get that nice sonorous Tom Woods voice that you you need on this show. we got to get that good quality audio back, and I need carpeting in this new office. So it's being measured for carpeting. But I actually have something other happy to tell you about, and this is just to show the diversity of interests of my listeners. I've got a listener who just started a website called clarionclavier.com, C-L-A-V-I-E-R, clarionclavier.com. It is a website centered around learning to play piano in your own home. You don't have to drive to some lesson or any, anything like that. You can have the convenience of learning in your own home and yet still be taught by a top-notch instructor. So you can take piano lessons online via Skype from a professional piano instructor. You can also find helpful tutorials and videos and information relating to studying the piano. So check it out at clarionclavier.com. I mean, you're learning piano from a Tom Woodshow listener. How great is that? Clarionclavier.com is the listener website mentioned for today. And of course, you all know this by now. You get goodies like this, including free publicity, as long as you get your hosting through my link. And you get a really good deal on your hosting. So everybody's happy. Everybody in the world is happy. Check out how to get all these neat bonuses from me at tomwoods.com slash publicity. Now, this week, we got two more episodes coming because I'm not going to be releasing an episode on Good Friday, and I will then see you after Easter Sunday. So that's it for today. Thanks so much for listening. 
Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.